Let's open to, pay, uh, to uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews, chapter 13. Let me begin with the first six verses today. Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 6. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourself also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If there's any doubt about the authorship of the book of Hebrews, uh, there can be very little about chapter 13. We're on Pauline ground, very solidly. Much of this last chapter matches Paul's style throughout his other letters. Look at the two previous books, Titus and Philemon. And notice his closings there. Titus chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. Verse 15. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And also look forward at Philemon. Very, very short book. Philemon, verses 22 and 23. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And look at the end of chapter 13 here, Hebrews 13, verse 23. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Verse 25, grace be with you all. Amen. Same style of writing, same type of closing. Verse 1 says, let brotherly love continue, which needs no comment. That matches Paul's letter to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. He also wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Doctrinally, chapter 13 is aimed at the church age believer. In this chapter, not once do the words we, us, ye, or you refer to Jews on the threshold of salvation or the threshold of a kingdom that they're expecting or restored kingdom, which is still valid, uh, or facing tribulation, which indeed will come. How do we explain the change in subject matter? How do we explain the change in Paul's emphasis from the first 12 chapters to chapter 13. I want you to uh, bear with me, be patient with me for a little while. I do need you, however, to turn back to a couple of his letters, uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 1. Go to Galatians, chapter 1. And start there with me as I read verse 11. Galatians 1, I'm going to start at verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, 
how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. For they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Go forward to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and I'm going to begin there at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that is Jew versus Gentile, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man." so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God, Jew and Gentile, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Enmity means a natural conflict, animosity, a, a, a disagreement. You're both working to, to opposite ends. You have nothing in common with each other. Look also down at um, chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is that mystery? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The change in Paul's emphasis in the book of Hebrews, from the first 12 chapters to chapter 13, can be understood if he wrote the first 12 chapters before the full revelation of the body of believers, Jew and Gentile, was made known to him. He said after he was converted, he took off into the desert to be alone with God. And then it took him three years before he went to Jerusalem and uh, conferred with Simon Peter and the other apostles. And the things that God was showing him, he made sure that it squared with everything they were preaching, what they had understood. But God made known to the Apostle Paul things he hadn't made known to anyone else at that time. The language of chapter 10 in Hebrews indicates that the temple was still standing, the sacrifices of the Levites were still being offered, so it was well before 70 AD, so we don't know exactly the date or the year 
that the book of Hebrews was first begun to be written and when he finished it. But it seems to be that chapter 13 was written by the Apostle Paul after he understood that now both Jews and Gentiles share in the same grace of God and look forward to the same redemption by Jesus Christ and have the same promises of eternal life and glory with the Lord Jesus one day. The, gen the, the nation of Israel as a nation uh, and the kingdom of the Jew will still be returned once again. God made, we talked about this last week, God made promises to Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter 15 while Abraham was asleep. It wasn't conditioned upon him obeying the Mosaic law later when it showed up. He promised him a certain piece of land on this earth and by association dominion over all the other nations of the world. That hasn't happened yet, and it had no conditions attached to it. So even if the Jew doesn't fully believe, the, the, the race or the people of the Jew who God identifies will inherit the land God has set aside for them all the same. Now, let me continue here. Verse 2 says to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unawares. The word entertain doesn't mean to distract them or divert them by you know, telling them jokes and singing a song. Not in that sense of the word, but the original sense of the word entertain simply means to show hospitality, to be welcoming to that person. And the chief example would be Lot back in Genesis chapter 19 who lets two men into his house thinking that they're angels. In the Bible, angels always appear as young men. There are no female angels depicted in the scriptures. Sorry about that, ladies, but that's nevertheless the truth. There are no uh, baby angels. There are no chubby cherubs with a diaper. None of that in the Bible. That's not in the Bible either. And angels in the Bible do not have wings on their backs. That's from Roman Catholic folklore. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. But you draw a picture of people and you draw angels, but you don't put wings on them. They don't know what it is. So you have to put wings. Oh, sure, that's an angel now. I recognize it. But it's not scriptural. Also, Satan was never an angel. He was an anointed cherub. There are two different classifications in the scriptures. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art that anointed cherub which covereth. And uh, until it was perfect in thy, in thy creation until iniquity, iniquity was found in thee. So at one point he lost that position over the throne of God. Now the Bible only describes four cherub. Uh, verse 2, strangers unawares. To be unaware of something is to not know its true nature. For the believer... I want you to look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And notice there verses 4 through 7. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. If you give someone the benefit of the doubt, and they end up cheating you, and they end up lying to you and deceiving you, disappointing you. You know what that means? The next time someone needs some help, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt too. So it's only natural that it says charity suffereth long. You, you put up with a lot of garbage from people sometimes. A friend of mine, you know, that doesn't mean that you should be a sucker. 
and give a couple of bucks to everybody that's standing by the side of the freeway Amen. with a cardboard sign. We have a small, a very small uh, neighborhood block where my uh, employment is. I'm taking a break one day, 15 minute break, but I decided I'm going to walk around that block. It's total, it's just a, a couple of hundred yards, maybe 300 yards around the block. Three different people approached me in that 10, 15 minute break asking for a handout. Three, I mean, you don't dare uh, go to P-Town in a suit and tie. I mean, you're gonna be, <laughs> you're gonna be hit up. And um, there's always somebody who's engaged in conversation with himself and you have, or with somebody, imaginary friend, you don't know what to do. A friend of mine and I were coming back from an errand for work. He was driving, I was in the passenger seat, going down the off-ramp there at uh, Town Avenue in the 10 freeway. Halfway down the off-ramp, there's a car off to the right side. There was a lady holding a baby on the outside, the passenger side. And on the driver's side, there was another woman with a cardboard sign, out of gas, please help. And she was doing this thing, so you had to slow down to not hit her as you went down the ramp. And my friend driving said, man, that must stink to run out of gas right there. And I told him, yeah, it's a good thing she had that sign ready to go. At the end of the off-ramp, there's a gas station. <laughs> I said, it was a bad choice of location. You know, That's what they say in real estate. It's location, 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 right, if you want to succeed. So you don't want to be a, a sucker. And if you have obligations, you have bills to pay, or you have children you to, to care for, you have family to raise, you, you need to feed them, you need to provide for them, you have... Uh, things that your money is already spoken for and obligated to, then that's your first priority. Take care of those who are closest to you first. If there's anything left over, then that's between you and God and the person you might want to give it to. So, at the same time, Paul tells the preachers to watch thou in all things, 2 Timothy 4, and he reminds all believers there is none that seeketh after God, Romans 3. So, figuring out what to do from case to case is between you and God and the work of the Holy Spirit to have charity. By the way, it bears repeating, we've said it many times, all the modern versions say love. The grace of these is love. Charity is a better word because charity is love being put into action. You should keep that in mind. And uh, someone might not want the gospel track, but you should keep trying to pass them out anyway. When we, <clears throat> whenever our kids on the sidewalk pass one out, someone, and they walk down the sidewalk and you, they see it, they see the person throw it on the ground. They're not throwing it on the ground because they're afraid of what's in it. They throw it on the ground because they know what's in it. They're not interested in Jesus Christ. People are going to do what they want to do, and it's rather unfortunate that they don't want the one who can help them, the one who can actually save their soul and cleanse them from their sin. Verse 3, let's read that again. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body, them that are in bonds. That can be applied two ways, either to a church age saint behind bars uh, or to someone in the tribulation suffering persecution. That verse could apply when that time comes as well. Paul expresses the same sentiment when he writes, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, Romans 12, verse 15. He also says, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. Most believers in America probably won't spend a good deal of their life behind bars, in jail, or in prison. Thank the Lord for that. But there are some great Christian people 
some great saved saints of God, men and women, who are in county jails and in state and federal prisons in this country right now. It may be that they never would have turned to the Lord Jesus had they not been arrested for something, had they not made the biggest mistake they could ever make and God made something good out of their situation. You never know, you never can tell. But uh, there are a lot of great Christians, they may be in there, maybe sentenced there for the rest of their lives, behind bars, behind uh, federal prison walls. <clears throat> and it was only the, them being thrown into prison, ending up there, that they were broken down enough to respond to the gospel and hear it and say, yes, that's me. i got to stop trying to do it myself and trust that God will save me. Trust that Jesus Christ died for my sake. God wants to save me. I believe God wants to save men. He wants to save women. He wants to make it as easy for someone to get saved as possible. Brother Charles and I were talking about this uh, several months ago, <clears throat> that uh, when a person, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you turn to Jesus Christ in desperation, God, help. I don't know what to do. You know, in your heart, you might not even say those words, but in your heart, you're at your wit's end. You're at, you're at the end of your road. You don't know what to do. If you're, God sees the heart, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, the Bible says. He sees the heart. He knows if you're just crying out because you just don't want to get caught for doing something stupid, or you've been caught and you're desperate, you want God's help, you don't know where else to turn. And you're finally willing to turn to Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you get saved, you don't have to fully understand uh, that Christ came into the world born of a virgin, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he then was scourged and nailed to a cross, uh, then was buried for three days and three nights, that he rose again from the dead. And you don't have to understand all the details. You don't have to understand the sequence of that. If you understand that only God can help, you cry out to God. Amen. God will save you. I believe God will save you. Somebody that's not a good swimmer and they're swallowing water in a falling over a boat in a lake, they're desperate. They cry out to God, I don't want to die. Save me, God. God might save them. Somebody gets hit by a car, he's waiting for the ambulance to come. He, he doesn't know what, how much time he has left. His life flashes before his eyes, and in the best way he knows how, he cries out to God, save my soul. God, save me. God will do it. God will do it. Oh, um, But um, God's a good God. God wants to save souls. And it's with that idea in mind that we believe God has offered his word in the simplest form he could offer it. In a book. You know, if you can... Um, Susanna Wesley raised her children to learn how to read by reading the Bible. When they turned five years old, she started training them to read at Genesis 1, verse 1, sounding out every word till they were able to read it and pronounce it, and she would explain it to them little by little. That's how Americans learned how to read 150 years ago, 160 years ago. We didn't have public schools. You had a, if we did have a, a reader, a McGuffey reader, all the lessons on on morality, all the lessons on history, all the lessons on virtue and goodness and your duty as a citizen, all of them were drawn from the Word of God. Amen. That's how it ought to be now. And those were, those, by the way, when states uh, and the federal government began to organize a school system, in the earliest days of public schools, textbooks were still teaching Bible lessons. They were still teaching uh, what the stories and the, the carols of Christmas mean, the birth of Jesus Christ. They were still teaching the crucifixion and the uh, burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in public textbooks. They were still teaching that God created the heaven and the earth long before Charles Darwin and the theories of evolution were ever uh, adopted and added. That's another fiasco, another crime 
that used to teach one theory of creation that God did it in schools. And then the Scopes trial, 1922, in Tennessee, Dayton, Tennessee, they said it's wrong only teach one theory. We should teach at least a second theory and tell the students that these conflict or they're, they don't agree. And it's up to you as a student to decide which one is which, whether God did it according to the scriptures or according to Charles Darwin in the theories of evolution. So once they got both theories taught, then the evolutionists said, it's confusing to teach two theories. We should only teach one. So they went back on their own words. It's like the government saying, read my lips, no new taxes. <laughs> right? I don't want to read your lips, no new taxes. I want to read your lips, tax refunds for everybody. Yeah. Then I'll start reading your lips. Excuse me. <clears throat> but it's easy to forget those who are suffering behind jail and prisons who love the Lord Jesus Christ as much, maybe even more than you or I at, at times. Their field of testimony is limited. They try to live for Jesus Christ and talk about him, and if they can, be a testimony to other people behind bars. And thank God for those kinds of Christians. Amen. There are some great saints of God lingering behind bars and county jails and state prisons and federal prisons. He says, yourselves also in the body. Uh, that can also apply two ways. Either it's a reminder that both you and someone who's suffering are in the body of Christ together, or as if you were in their body. Put yourself in their shoes. We don't appreciate the measure of health that we have until it suffers a little bit. We don't appreciate the fact that we have a sound mind, we can think and reason, we can get up, we have energy to, to eat and to walk and to run and to work and to do a number of things. Uh, day after day after day, we take it for granted. We don't even thank God for it. We don't appreciate what we have until some of it is restricted, some of it's limited. And I've been telling people now for the last two to three years, I'm thankful for problems that I don't have. I had a lady email me and told me she was praying for me, but she said, you know, Pastor Mike, uh, God must love you a lot to know he can trust you with as much cancer as you've had for the last three years. And I think she meant well, but I emailed her back and said, I appreciate that. Thanks for praying. But the Lord's certainly welcome to love somebody else for a while if he wants. <laughs> a lot of other people that need love, too. And if he doesn't know who, I'll, I'll name a few. <laughs> he, he can love them. But um, but it's only the grace and the kindness and the mercy and the compassion and the goodness of God that you're not a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. That you've got your limbs and your faculties your intestines work. You're not bound with a colostomy bag or a number of other things that limit people. You have a full mind to think and to reason with. And it's only the goodness of God. You're not blind. You're not deaf. And uh, I've told um, people the last few years, God is better to me than I deserve. He really is. And he's better to you than you deserve. You think back on all the stupid things you've ever done, and while at the same time wanting to call yourself a Christian and being a disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ, why God would still love you, and yet he, he does. Why God would still keep your salvation intact, and yet he does. Why the Holy Spirit still lives inside your body, but he does. You think about this, and I said this a few weeks ago. Somebody who knows when they trusted Jesus Christ to save them. They can tell you the day and the date, the time, the place, who it was that helped them. Maybe they prayed with somebody. They know when that happened. And they have confidence that when they die, they'll wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ, just like that. But over the course of their lifetime, they may never do anything 
for the honor of Jesus Christ. They might be too afraid to talk to somebody. They won't invite them to even be my friend and come to church with me. Take an hour of your life, two hours of your life, and uh, read a track. They won't, they're afraid to do anything that would bring honor or bring focus to the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, they spend a lot of time doing stupid things that are actually embarrassing to Jesus Christ. That person will have no extra reward, rewards coming to him one day at the judgment seat. But he's saved nevertheless. And that person saved nevertheless who has done little or nothing for the Lord Jesus Christ is still going to live in eternity with the Son of God. He's going to live in a glorified body like the resurrected Son of God, a body that will never wear out, never get sick again, never know heartache or disease or weakness again, a body that will never shed a tear again, a body with unlimited uh, power. Think about, that's why I said the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our expect. He's the down payment of everything you're going to have when God makes your transformation complete. So even the Christian who does little or nothing to serve Jesus Christ in this life still has a mountain of blessings coming to him, a ton of blessings coming to him. But uh, as yourselves also in the body, put yourself in someone else's shoes uh, or in their circumstances. I remember when our youngest was born, Sarah, she had a misdeveloped uh, small intestines. And the day after she was delivered, she had to have a bowel resection. And she was rushed down to the children's hospital in Orange, had a surgery, brand new, you know, one day old baby doctor reconnecting those intestines. And uh, she was in the hospital for eight months while she began to grow. And of course, connected all sorts of tubes and heart monitors and oxygen monitors and feeding tubes and so forth. And it was after eight months that we finally were able to bring her home for the first time. But during the next three or four months, she had a number of setbacks and she had to go back to the hospital for a week or weekend. So I've told people that all told, she was in the hospital for a full year before we ever brought her home for the first time permanently. And even then, we had nurses uh, 16 hours a day at the house to help my wife take care of her so we could sleep at night. Um, now, she's the first one out of our house married and on her own. Thank the Lord for that. But, and, and God blessed her. And, but at the time, in the children's hospital, In the patients' rooms, there were rocking chairs put there so that when possible, the mother or dad could rock their baby. That means a lot. And on the backs of those chairs, there was the message engraved um, in memory of or in loving memory of the name of some other patient that had been there before. Either they had survived or they hadn't survived, but the parents understood how much the presence of that chair would mean to some future parents. It was a great blessing. We were lucky. Our baby survived. She got better and stronger and grew and developed. And uh, like I said, now she's married and out of the house. But some of the people we had met, their babies were in far worse condition than ours was. Their baby didn't live. Broke our hearts, too. But if you don't Put yourself in someone else's predicament or consider their predicament, their circumstances. You really don't know what it is to suffer with them. 
you really don't have a heart of empathy and compassion for them as you want to have. That should be something every true believer is known by. Genuine care and compassion for others who are suffering. The Bible says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith. Your first obligation as a Christian should be to other Christians. But Paul says to all men. So not just the other Christian, but somebody else who can benefit, who can be drawn close to God by your act of kindness, your act of love and selflessness and charity to do something for them that nobody else can do for them. In that regard, you are doing the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 in our text, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Marriage is honorable as an institution because it was God who first instituted it, Genesis chapter 2. Run back, if you will, to Genesis 2. That's in the Old Testament, right after Genesis 1. Genesis 2, <clears throat> two verses there quickly, verses 23 and 24. Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And we might add the first line of verse 25, they were both naked. Go forward to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. Here the Lord Jesus invokes that passage. As the words of Moses, Moses having written that down, verses 5 and 6, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, or two, shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And also Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Let me start there with verse 30. For we, that would be Paul and all Christians receiving this letter. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then he cites the text from Genesis 2. For this cause uh, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Flesh Joining flesh, the physical act, is what constitutes a marriage. That's the Bible's definition of the word marriage. Flesh joining flesh, when you're both naked. I'm not going to give any more details. You'll probably already know the details. And I want to say this with caution. There's a difference in the Bible between marriage, that is the physical union, and a marriage ceremony. That's something man instituted afterwards. A marriage in the Bible is defined as flesh joining flesh. And uh, flesh, you know, let me be careful saying this because I don't want anyone to misunderstand this. Flesh joining flesh that is somebody who's promised themselves to someone else, and they've married them in the biblical sense, 
and decides to join flesh to someone else, they are then marrying that other person. They're not having a legal marriage ceremony, but using the Bible's definition of the word, they are marrying that third per that other person. But that flesh joining flesh doesn't obligate you to that new person forever. It does, however, constitute adultery. It does constitute fornication. It does constitute whoremongering. And it shows that you've broken your promise to the first person you had committed yourself to. It proves that your word can't be trusted. If marriage, the physical union, is honorable, and all the promises that are implied by it, then someone who puts it asunder breaks that by a physical act with someone else has invited the judgment of God. The word sex means gender, male or female. By the way, there's only two. There's not 52 or 56 or however many the universities are debating on. Any moron that doesn't understand there's males and females uh, needs to be locked up. They're not safe. I won't trust them with a driver's license to operate a motor vehicle. They might see a red light or a green light. They won't know what to do. That yellow light, well, should I go? Should I stop? And but the word sex means gender. Sexuality is the physical act. And the modern age wants to say we want our kids to um, have they use that word sex to describe the physical act, when that's not the definition of the word, but it's used that way in modern society. But we want our kids to understand how to do this safely and not catch an STD or BD or uh, HIV or something. Stop doing it! Quit doing it, you pervert! But uh, why do we want kids to sin safely? That's basically what Society is telling the public schools, the government, we want our people to be able to sin safely. That's why that's why you have Juul, you know, don't smoke cigarettes, smoke this vapor product that uh, also contains nicotine. This nicotine has been caused, you know, they have these little warnings. Those are put out by the cigarette companies. They're not selling regular cigarettes, so they got to sell some so-called alternative. Um, we had a, when my daughter was small, we had a, a Seventh-day Adventist nurse that was working for us eight hours a day. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians. They don't believe in eating meat. But she would bring this artificial bacon and heat it up in our microwave, stunk up the house. It didn't smell good. So we called it fakin'. She was having a, some strips of bacon. I thought, well, if you're dedicated to, to not eating meat, why would you want to appear as if you are eating meat? Follow? Aren't you a bit hypocritical? It's like the Mormons that say, we don't drink Coke, all the caffeine, but we drink root beer. It, it looks basically the same. If you don't believe in drinking Coke, why would you appear as if you are drinking Coke? You want to fit in, right? The, the levels of hypocrisy in the world today that people engage in because they don't want to be left out, they don't want to seem different from everyone else is un unbelievable. But sex means gender. Sexuality is the conduct of your body with someone else. And someone who does so outside the, the accepted form of God, one husband, one wife, for one lifetime, that person is inviting the judgment of God. God judged the people committing incest. Book of Leviticus. He judged the Sodomites in the book of Genesis. He judged the people with animals in the book of Leviticus. He's going to judge them all. There's a whole long list of people who have uh, conducted themselves sexually, physically, outside the uh, bond 
of an, a committed husband and wife with or without the state's approval. Now, Romans chapter 12 said, it tells us, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. If the government says this is what we recognize as a marriage union with this license, this certificate, this on file, then go ahead and do it. You want to get along. You don't want to be some person who protesting the, the government's rules because then they're going to require why. Why are you protesting? What do you have against it? You're inviting more scrutiny on yourself than you need. You don't want to invite the, the troubles and the, the investigation of the government over you. The, gov the government, I was reading somewhere, the government has at least 17 files, one kind or another, on every citizen in the country. You have a social security file, you have a driver's license file, you have any number of other things. But why would you want to invite even more scrutiny on yourself? If the government says this is what we recognize as a, as a marriage, then you ought to submit yourself to the authorities, the ordinances of man, and get a proper marriage license and commit yourself to that man or that woman uh, and not stray and not fool around with somebody else. And you should control yourself until you've made it as proper as you possibly can. Because we do these things in the eyes of man and the eyes of God, before the minister, before everyone who are our friends. And when you do it in those proper ways, those things that everybody accepts as the proper accepted way to declare your love for that man or for that woman, then you have the blessing of all of your friends who are there to witness it. The marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. You have their blessing for you to be uh, happily married for the rest of your lives together, if God permits. And you make promises and pledges to each other that shouldn't be broken. And he says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Um, verse 5 in our text, I'm going to try to move along. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And for time's sake, let me turn to it. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So the word conversation means the way you live that can be seen, as well as your speech. Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the Lord Jesus said, Matthew 12. And um, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he gives examples, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is wanting what someone else has, wanting more than you've been allowed to have or have been given. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, having food and raiment therewith, let us be content. He didn't even allow to have a roof over your head. If you have food uh, and uh, clothing, you're to be happy with that. If you have a roof over your head, that's icing on the cake. I'm glad I have a roof over my head. I'm glad I have a place to sleep and a bed with blankets to keep me warm at night. But if you didn't have that, you're still to be content. See, modern Christians don't want to take the Bible too far. They don't want to push it that far and say, well, I got to have these things, my food, shelter, and clothing. I have these are my basic needs. Not according to the Bible, they're not. But that's why modern man wants to rewrite the Bible change the Bible, reword the Bible, say that's not what it meant. It's all figurative. It's all allegory. It doesn't really mean that. You don't have to take it literally. It doesn't mean exactly what it says on the page. If the Bible is all symbolic, it's all figurative, it's just metaphor, none of it's to be taken literally, then anybody's interpretation is just as good as anybody else's. You can't, you don't narrow it down and say this is exactly what it means. But when, when, you, when you say I'm a Bible believer, I believe what it says and I'm going to take what it says to the logical understanding that if you have a roof over your head, that's just icing on the cake. 
a lot of Amer Americans with a lot of icing, right? Mm -hmm. Other countries, uh, they don't have a roof over their heads, and the roof they do have gets washed away in the first rainstorm, the first windstorm. And then verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The original is back in Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Let's finish today with 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go forward two or three pages. 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'll be done. Start at verse 12. <clears throat> For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open under their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, and who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, that's your way of living, in Christ. So if you're doing right, living right, trying to please God as God would want you to, and, and be a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the world might not like it, but don't worry, the world's on its way to hell. Uh, you live for Jesus Christ, and uh, not fear what man can do unto you.